I'm Anna Webb. Welcome to A Dog's Life. Hey, Mr Binks. You know that we often talk about guide dogs for the blind and how amazing they are and how maybe one day you might have been a guide dog. But the thing is, Binks, you're too short. I know. But anyway, this is why we're jumping on Zoom to talk to journalist and author Beverly Byrne about her Labradors and why profits from her short stories are going to help Theo, a guide dog in training. Beverly, welcome to A Dog's Life. Well, thanks, Anna. It's really nice of you to have me on the show. Well, no, not at all. You know, I absolutely love your short stories, which is really, you know, how we got together to have lots of chats about Labradors in the main. Absolutely. It's it's uh, it's a joy always to talk about dogs and Labradors in particular, because they are are my favourites. I have to say I shouldn't say that really, should I? But there we go. They are. Well, you're not alone. (laughs) They they are Britain's most popular dog. (laughs) Yeah. And with good reason. Exactly. No, indeed. No, absolutely. No, I grew up with uh, gun dogs. My my dad was firmly a gun dog man, you know. Oh. Uh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He had many Labradors um, through his life, but he kind of progressed to English Springers, working type English oh, Springers. Um, yes. That's what I grew up with, as well as lots of other dogs. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not all in the same house with my aunt, who um, was uh, a dog aficionado, if you like. But yeah. that's uh, and that's how I sort of got all my knowledge. Re- ah, really, I see. Dad. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We always took on the gun shy Springers, you see, oh. who wouldn't make the grade as as a gun dog. So because Dan. And, you know, being involved with the RSPCA, you know, we always rescued. We always took on the ones nobody wanted. (laughs) Right. So that's where it all really began for me, to be honest. And, and, um, yeah, he certainly, dad loved dogs and was brilliant around dogs. So he taught me everything, really. I and then, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for you, you know, you, you've got two Labradors. I've got two Labradors at the moment. But like you, we, we had Labradors and Springers because um, my husband does go sort of shooting, rough shooting, and I went out eating uh, with the Springers. He did the Labradors and I did the Springers. And... Uh, which was um, interesting because that's when I learned that you can train a springer so far, you may agree with this or not, um, and then you say, remember what I taught you yesterday? And they go, no, I'm off. And then if you do it with a Labrador, they go, yes, I remember exactly what you said to me yesterday and now I will perform to your every letter. So I just think they retain information better. But as I say, I'm no expert. No, no, it's very interesting. Um, you know, these spaniels, they're not necessarily easy dogs. I think oh. that's why a lot of people are having problems with um, <laughs> the cockapoo, which seems to be oh. um, ruling the horizon, certainly in London at the minute, because many of them are crossed with working cocker spaniels yeah. that are arguably one of the most difficult breeds to live with because they have such a high prey drive in so much as they want to they have to be out sniffing out rabbits they have to find those pheasants they've got to flush them out they've got to fly they've got to be busy and if they're not busy you know and satisfied an instinctual level they you know (laughs) start to be destructive get frustrated and and even start resource guarding and biting people. I've seen it all lately. Really? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but just talking about a Springer just very quickly and we'll move on from Springers. But, <laughs> oh, my, when my first Bull Terrier, Beverly, Molly, yeah. got lost in a wheat field when I was living um, in, in oh. uh, Buckinghamshire. Yeah, absolutely awful, dreadful. Um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it was Sam, the Springer, that was the only person, if you like, that found her she, without Sam the Springer, Molly would have died that night because she no. was already 
Yeah, 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 yeah. It was summer, obviously, because the wheat was so high. But, you know, it's Britain. And so overnight, it was getting pretty cold, you know, for Molly, who was 12 and had never been alone for 12 hours in her entire life. And she had to have a horrible 12 hours alone, trapped in a wheat field. But, wow. you know, the amazing power of dogs. And I remember Radio Joe, Joanne Good was yeah. with me and she couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe seeing this spring of work. Got a whiff of Molly's collar and the dog just knew what the he had to do right and diving in and out of these ditches like no care for brambles or sticks no. it was like this was a mission and the height that he could spring I mean this is why they're called springers <laughs> yeah. I mean Joe just couldn't believe it and it was his springing that enabled him he knew what he had to do it was extraordinary that had to get him above the wheat enough to see the spot that Molly had trampled she'd spent 12 uh, hours trampling some wheat to create like you know like the aliens are supposed yeah, to yeah. do yeah make one of those and but of course the human eye can't see that because you become snow blind by the wheat because there's so yeah. much of it and it's so dense but yeah and uh luckily yeah molly made it home that night thanks to sam the springer absolutely and the whole village had come out trying to trample and go up and down the little alleyways oh. in the wheat to no avail all day long I and mean, this was the mad thing and moles was deaf at the time but it was just yes the springer and this working drive-in dogs you you know this is what you know, it's what we've had with dogs through 30,000 years. This this um, one man and their dog, the, the working relationship where dogs had a purpose, right, Beverly? That's right. I mean, I, I, I loved watching the spring. Well, I like all, watching all dogs work because when, when they get that kind of you know, desire to go and often the springer will go far too far. But, but generally just watching them work is an absolute joy and I can see it in my particularly my young Labrador because she came from a litter of pups that was owned by a guy who goes wild fowling and she's just mad about birds I mean she's just she can see them she watches like aeroplanes in the back garden you know she's like oh what's that that's gonna be great I'm gonna chase that but she she has got that natural instinct and I had I did take her to a a very small local farmer's shoot down in Devon and thought, oh, that's it, a whole year of training down the drain because she's so shot off. But when I saw her coming back and so energised and you're thinking this is what this particular breed is made for. And I, I hear what you're saying about the cockapoo. I think it's a real shame that um, it's become so popular and it's kind of got the worst traits of both in some cases. Cockapoo owners will listen to this and say, what are you talking about? But it can happen with these these crosses um I, and I think I think it's uh it's a it's a real shame when you do limit what their potential is yeah 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 absolutely and that what would, it's just that seriously cockapoos they are suffering from a lot of anxiety yeah I've never seen anything quite like it to be honest and, right. and it is yes yeah I'm not the only person to say and um it causes you know their first time dog owner parents huge stress yeah. because yeah. they don't understand that they're not fulfilling their dog's life basically um Absolutely. and so anxiety and destruction and fear and everything yeah. builds just like it would do in a human really Absolutely. Uh, but yeah no so you your two labradors one's called lily <laughs> and the younger one's called dora that's right, right. yeah and in your short stories which are wonderful yeah. the first one is called and the dog gets it you know which i love as a title and it's really it's not really dora's story your no. your no no but your your it's such great imagination i was i've read both the stories i'd like to highlight again this morning actually and i i've got to say beverly you know you in, in just a few words you really paint a vivid picture well, that's really kind of you. Thank you, Anna. I'm I'm chuffed because if that's the case, I'm I'm a I'm a happy writer. Yes, well, you know, because the short story is pretty difficult, really, in a way, because I always find with writing, it's the shorter the word count, in a way, is more difficult than yeah. a massive long one. What do you think? I I do, but I I I am a journalist by trade, so I kind of think you know, twelve hundred words is where I'm at most of the time. So. Although when I first tried, started trying to write fiction, 
Yes, you just do. You go mad with the adjectives. You go mad with the adverbs. And then you think, oh, no, chop that out, chop that out. Like you do when you're a journalist, you know, you have to get it down. So, and I really enjoy the editing process. So so it's it's uh, it, it was a good learning curve for me. Yes. And was this a lockdown project, Beverly? Yeah, yeah. I've got something to do. And then you know, <laughs> but yes, I mean, I've been going to Morley College to, to do um, fiction writing courses. And I met a group of people there and we just carried on doing it. So every week we set ourselves ourselves a task to write in a different genre or just write from a prompt or a photograph or whatever. And it was a really good training ground for me because we would have nothing else to do. I mean, so we were just sitting there pounding away on the laptops and going, well, what do you think of this then the next week? And so that's how I ended up with so many stories. And then I started entering competitions and you know, I was doing you know, reasonably well getting getting stuff published and what have you. And once they're published, you can't do anything with them. Uh, they remain your copyright, but you can't enter them in competitions. You can't sell them anywhere else. So I thought, oh, why I don't did... I? Wow, yeah. I didn't know that. How that, weird. That is generally the case that if you do enter a competition, you'll see in the rules and regs, you know, you, you can't enter something that's been published before. I suppose that's fair enough because otherwise people just <laughs> keep turning out the same one all the time. Yeah, but, I uh, see what you mean. Yes, yes. It, it, that, that's how the book came about because I'd got all these stories that had appeared somewhere else in some form or other. And I thought, what can I do with them? So I thought, yeah, I'll put them together in a book and I'll do it for charity. And the charity was a no brainer, you know, uh, Labradors that do good works, the um, association for the guide dog so that, that was how it happened but your affinity with guide dogs which you know I applaud um yeah I wanted to be a guide dog trainer when I was Ooh. growing up actually because obviously I'm the blue peter generation of the first yeah. time, you know and their involvement with guide dogs which back then was really the first assistance dog charity really you know guide dogs you know was then followed by hearing dogs and dogs for the disabled and dogs yeah. for good and it go you know and the, you know the scope now is enormous but it all really began you know with one uh, german shepherd actually that was swiss that went to new york and people couldn't believe it as he guided his sight impaired owner I might cry across madison avenue i never knew that that is amazing. All I heard of was the, the four German shepherds in the UK that were trained for guide dogs in 1931 who were assigned to um, soldiers who'd been blinded with mustard gas during the First World War. How interesting. No, that's very interesting. I didn't realise it went back, but I'm sure I'm right. I'm sure the dog I'm was sure called Buddy. Right. But, yeah. you know, but but it was wonderful. So there was this wonderful, um, oh, uh Oh, kind of retrospective of guide dogs that I went to. I mean, many really ages ago, and it was in the Museum of London, actually. Oh. And it was um, a real total immersive interactive experience of walking through the history of guide dogs. And it was, you know, beyond impactful, I can, uh, yeah, as you would imagine. But, yeah. but yeah, so in the book, though, your first short story is all <laughs> about Dora in a different, your dog in a different kind of yeah. era, yeah. time frame, zone. Um, and she actually becomes a guide dog, doesn't she? Yeah, she she is told from her point of view. And the first bit is kind of true because I did get her from this guy who was a, a wildfowler. And I write about that in the story from her perspective of growing up in this really happy household with lots of bundling brothers and sisters. And she doesn't she doesn't know what's happening. And I, I, I sort of imagine puppies like you would think, well, yeah, why have I been taken away? Where am I going now? What's this? And well, I'm in, in, in this car with this person being taken. So why have I gone to big school? And it's it, it was that, really. When Dora was a puppy and I was sitting at the kitchen table waiting to take her out when she showed a desire to do that, I um I thought, well, you know, what, what would a guide dog think? Um, so that's where it came from. That was the inspiration. It's like, and I looked up what would happen but of course most guide dogs are bred specifically for that purpose I mean I've I've had, I've had to use a bit of uh, latitude there by by having her being born at, at, you know, in a carpenter's um, uh, hut not hut but you know workshop in Somerset so that's where I got her. Yeah oh no I love it and I just love it that you're really thinking about it all and it's written a bit like Virginia Woolf's 
Flush, you know, which was such yeah. a yeah iconic book of of its day. I, I mean, it's one of my favorite ever books because you know it's seen through the dog's eyes, which can be quite difficult to write. So I I just think it's brilliant because it shows how much you think about your dog from her perspective, which is one of my big things at the moment. <laughs> I think well, if, for some reason, I find it really quite easy to put myself in the position. It's like acting, really, you know, just try, trying to put yourself in, in somebody else's or somebody or something else's mind and say, well, how, how would I behave in this situation? So, um, hmm. and, and, and I've, I've written a couple of other you know, dog based stories from their perspective. Um, one that was about a, you know, a, a woman who owned a dog who, um, her, actually managed to get her um, partner through dogs meeting in the park so it was you know pupdate.com and uh, and I, I really enjoyed writing that because she was a poodle and she was very sort of poodle-esque and very <laughs> sleek and beautiful and uh, yeah you, it, it, it's just play it's having fun really and that's what you do with dogs even if it's just in your head yeah, no, I love that. No, it is why you have dogs to have fun, and that's what dogs love having the most. They fun. do. You know, they're not. They don't have to worry about anything in life. They don't understand what stress is, and I think stress can be such an emotional contagion. But I think, am I right, Beverly? You sponsor a guide dog as well because of your mum. Well, I I sponsor the guide dog because the book, um, as I said, is. Yeah, is sold in aid of guide dogs for the blind association. So all the proceeds um, are going to that charity. So with the money that I, I've raised so far, yeah, we've we've all you know all the people that bought the book so far have sponsored uh, a dog called Theo, who looks adorable, but they all do, don't they? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I had to wait until there was one that I really liked the look of <laughs> because. There was, I really like Yellow Labs. Dora is a cool, she's fox red. But, um, and the, the adorable Theo turned up um, and thought, oh, that's where the money's going. And I hope he makes the grade. Oh, gosh, yes, I know, because that's the thing. The journey for a guide dog really begins, as as you, you put in this short story, with a puppy raiser. So they don't really start their, their training until they're about one years old, do they? No, no, I gather not. I think they they go to a foster foster family or foster carer until they're well, um, nearly two, oh. and then they, they. I think they go to a puppy a, a puppy raiser first, and they may go on to another family. I'm not quite sure about that, but they they are with this this person who's obviously been vetted by the, the charity and and you need a nice calm quiet environment for them to be brought up in and they do basic training and then the, the puppy ends up going to you know big school uh good college uh, to learn how to do it and then they at two or so they will be assigned to um somebody with sight impairment and if they don't make the grade apparently um they may go to a child who has uh, become a buddy for a child that has sight impairment, or they can be, you know, the fosterers can opt to have them back. So, you know, not all of them make the grade, unfortunately, but they'll all be loved and they will all be, you know, very, very useful in their in their working lives, whatever they do. Oh, absolutely. And I think some of the charities, you know, they, they all talk to one another, be it dogs for good or medical yeah. detection dogs. And and if there is a particular dog that, you know, they think Rush, his olfaction is off the graph, maybe let's talk to medical detection dogs and yeah. see if this dog could be of I'm use, sure. you know, to them. So it's, it's a great community and, and really showing, you know, the power of dogs, really. But absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But another going back to the short stories. I was really moved by Dog Days, uh, Beverly, actually, because am I right? I mean, it's really looking at grief through, in a way, through a dog's eyes. Well, I, you could you could see it like that. I mean, for me, it was based on something that actually happened to, um, to me when I was travelling in Guatemala. And um, a... I was with this friend, Karen, and there were so many stray dogs. I have never seen anything like it. They were just lying, panting in the sun, like you know, a dog carpet everywhere you went. And it was in this village called Chichi Castanengo, which is the most beautiful, vibrant, colourful 
place you could possibly imagine. And as we were coming out of the church, where all these flower sellers were sitting, like a waterfall of colour, and we came down the steps from this church, which was an amazing place in itself. And this dog was following us, and it kind of gummed my fingers as I was walking <laughs> along, which was pretty scary, really. And anyway, um, it followed us everywhere. It followed us into the cemetery and it and then, and we started running away from it because it was a bit spooky and then in the next day you come out of the hotel there's this thing sort of going hi <laughs> hi girls <laughs> you know sort of, and it would follow us again and in the end we we did run away to a cafe which was on the first floor we ran up some stairs and I remember we looked over the balustrade and we we're going it's still there <laughs> so it, was, it was just extraordinary that this dog would not leave us alone and it so the story is based on that incident and yeah there, there's a there's a different uh, agenda there and yes you're right I mean that, that particular aspect of it is about grief um and betrayal in fact so um so that's that was the um the inspiration that dog in Guatemala was the inspiration for all that story wow well gosh yeah the street I mean it's such an education when you go somewhere like India or South America you know and you see the street dogs and oh your heart goes out doesn't it to all of them well it has done for me you know I be thinking right I want to bring that one back that one back you and must it, do. Yeah, yeah yeah and you just think oh you know but it's cultural really you know and it's it's often poverty certainly in India oh. rather than you know abject you know <laughs> planned cruelty and neglect no no it's it's absolutely true I mean there is a level of poverty out there but the, yeah the dog's not going to get a look in no so, no that's is it and and obviously there's you know very few people who will be trying to make sure that they're spayed or whatever so they're not reproducing but even so I mean seeing puppies playing in the road with these you know trucks thundering by the oh my lord it's just so awful so no I know I've gosh I know I've been that you know I've been there I've seen yeah. three puppies reduced to only one puppy and oh. um well, yeah and things like that but but oh but moving on to more cheerier yes. subjects really <laughs> Yeah, no, it's brilliant. Um, the short story is so recommend. Thank you, everybody. Anna. Go on the website and, and download all of that. But but bringing you back, you know, to your own dogs mm. with you right now and everything, you know, it's one of those things, isn't it? You've brought in Dora to be the young dog to kind of give Lily, your older Labrador, perhaps, you know, a, a bit of inspiration to get a bit of a spring in her step again. What would you say? <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that because um, I think Lily had got, I got Lily at, at five years old uh, from a gamekeeper actually in Devon. And I, I, I suspect she actually wasn't that good. Otherwise he wouldn't have <laughs> homed her. But also he moved to a village and, and Lily had her brother which she'd always she'd been brought up with, and they'd been kenneled, and this guy moved to a village, so he had neighbours, and they howled, and that's why he rehomed them. So we went, oh yes, and we just at the point where I'd lost my last finger, actually, about six months before, totally bereft. You know what it's like, and then suddenly there's this friend of ours going, oh, do you want this Labrador? So I was like, oh yeah, please, she's lovely. So she turned into the most cool dog you've ever had. So. Immediately, despite the fact she'd been kennel. In fact, we, we made a kennel here. We bashed out this hole in the garage and made a palatial kennel for her inside the garage so she could get in and out and she could just roam the garden. And she was in there for about 10 minutes the first night and howled. And that was it. She'd been sleeping in the kitchen ever since. So she instantly turned into a pet. And I thought, this is great. And she's just gorgeous. And so now seven years on. She's coming up to 12. And so for the last couple of years, I've been thinking I need I need a young pretender. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, more for me um, than for Lily, I have to say, because I think Lily took one look at Dora and gone, what have you done? What is that? Uh -huh. And just, oh, no, this is just too much. Because she's, she's so laid back. It's now that Dora is coming up to 15 months old. I think Lily is thinking, oh, she's not that bad you know they 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 lie together very sweetly it's it's a very and Laura adores Lily you can see her just it shines out oh my big sister 
Oh, that's so lovely. But they do say, you know, with an older dog to bring a young one in, it does, you know, just give them even a bit of a sort of competitive spirit, you know, to sort of <laughs> perk up their ideas again and and have some other kind of stimulations. It's about enrichment, isn't it, always? And what Lily finds most enriching is the training with treats bit, because I, I've, I've been training Dora with, you know, through, through positive reinforcement and Lily thinks this is great because she gets the treats as well so this is this has brightened her life up no end yeah no absolutely absolutely now Dora's had a few digestion problems hasn't she, she Beverly did. or yes she did she was um very picky I say picky eater she ate because she was brought up on the puppy kibble that the um the Peter who I got her off he put all the pups on, so I just carried on with that until, until the you know, the appropriate time when you start mixing up with older, uh, with, you know, more grown up grub, as it were. And uh, it was always a bit, um, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, a bit on the loose side. And she also took ages that she, the one Labrador you've ever had that chews every single tiny piece of dried dog food, and so it took her a year to get through a, a, a bowlful. But yeah, and I, I I did actually talk to you about it, and um, you were you very kindly recommended collagen, um, and that along with changing uh, the dog food, she's still on dry dog food. Okay, um, and I and it is absolutely brilliant because apart from the fact she looks like she's wearing a Father Christmas beard after she's had the cold because it's a powder. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> so, so she gets it. So I have to. You know, sort of flick it up into her tongue. Oh, Lily's on it as well now. And the thing is, I was really quite surprised because I thought, they're never going to have this powder. You know, it's going to, well, it wouldn't put Lily off, but because Dora's been a bit, you know, about food. Suddenly she's, are they woof, woofing it down um, and licking the bowl like some, you know, Dickensian character? Um, Please, sir, can I have some more? And it's, it's, been, it's been a real godsend. Oh, thank you, Anna. No, not at all. I mean, Beverly, you know, this is great. Now, you see, this all began because I'm a bit of a collagen freak. You know, I take collagen and this firm actually does do a human collagen. And I, I really noticed that my hair had got thicker because I had a hair disaster. Don't oh, really? Story. Yeah, oh, about a year oh. ago. Oh, did, no, I was really upset about it. But anyway, Ooh, it seems... Yeah, I'm important. But anyway, this collagen has definitely helped my hair come back again. OK, because half wow. of it fell out because it was double bleached. A long story. Um, <laughs> changed hairdresser, obviously. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and then I found out they've got a brand for dogs, the first ever collagen, you know, for dogs. And I was like, oh, gosh, they ha this has to be tried. And I I absolutely love it. I've really noticed the difference in uh, my dog's skin and coat as well. But it's all the other benefits of collagen that's good for us all to have because collagen in all mammals, I mean, my cat's on it as well, my cat Kremlin. Yeah, yeah, because all mammals, in all mammals, collagen depletes, sadly, you know, damn it, oh, yeah. with age. So whether you're, you know, a cat, a rabbit, a human, you will lose collagen. And collagen obviously supports the joints. And it's important, I thought it would be good for your Lily as well, as she is nearly 12. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, the other thing I've noticed about Dora could be coincidental. I know she's growing up, but the the, the other reason I had to, to wind back a bit when I got her, I knew I was going away uh, on a work trip for a month, and a, a girlfriend was going to look after her for me um, while I was away. So she had to be in really, really tip top behaviour, um, you know, mode to to go and stay with my my friend. And when I picked her up, and I thought, God, she looks really great. She looks really glossy and what have you. And that that was about a month ago. So it was like sending her to finishing school. <laughs> <laughs> and and, the, and that, the collagen thing has been going on for a while. And what's happened with, with Dora is she's just suddenly developed these, this wonderful musculature. And she was always a bit of a skinny mini before that. I thought, oh, she's just going to be one of those, you know, not a great big sort of muscly Labrador. She's going to be the sort of Kate Moss of Labradors. But no, we're, we're getting this beautiful uh, um, musculature on her. And, and I'm wondering if that's down to the collagen as well. 
Well, it, you know, that's that's interesting. It might well be. I mean, dogs do fill out, you know. Yes. I, I always say dogs aren't really sort of fully grown grown until they're about two and a half. So it might just be natural. It might have been yeah. enhanced by the collagen. No, I'm just awfully pleased. And what about her stools? Have you seen any? Yeah, Such, I hope no one's eating their lunch. Yeah, I know. Sorry, guys. But uh, yeah, they're all lovely and firm. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's, a, it's a, a transformation in that department. So, so we're all very happy about that. No, that's great. That's great. Well, I'm I'm awfully <laughs> pleased. No, I'm loving it. Um, as I say, you know, I'm taking the human version and the dogs and Remley are taking the dog one. So I'm happy with it, actually. And I think, um, but you see, you know, mine are on a, a raw species appropriate diet. So, um, you know, I, I know they... you saying about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. I know. I will nag you, Beverly. And... <laughs> I know. It's, it's I, I, I suppose, because I've had so many dogs. We've had so many dogs over the years and they've always... <laughs> been on dry food and probably I hate to say this the cheapest so it'll be mm. you know supermarket or going into the local store and just getting a 15 kilo bag of you know whatever and they've all just watered it down so I've never had any problem with with the dog before this um and so I, I want it to be easy and I don't want to feed dogs different things and that sort of thing so um, that's why I've always resisted the um, the more um, esoteric type of dog food. And but I mean, I mean, loads of people over the partner saying, "Oh, I've got, got you know, her or him on this on this raw raw dog food," and I know you love it. But um, I'm so, I personally, I'm very pleased that she's on the dry dog food with the college with the Father Christmas beard, and it's all lovely. Absolutely, everyone's got their their own lifestyles and their own yeah. preferences, and so absolutely. And if your dogs are doing okay on it, then great, you know. And both your dogs are from working stock, yeah. And it, a lot of all of this is in your genes already. That's the thing. And it sounds like Dora's a, a very healthy, healthy young girl, and Lily's doing great for twelve. Absolutely, she is. And and the other thing is because I was lucky when I got Dora because. Um, th this guy, uh, the, the carpenter guy, he had the mother and the grandmother there as well. And they were, they look exactly like Dora, you know, now. And they were the most placid, calm dog. And that's the other thing that's happened to Dora in the last month, actually. She's just completely calmed down. So all that, like, real mad puppy stuff, where she's tearing about and not coming back I mean she was actually she's been quite good about coming back the training I, I spent six months just being completely exhausted and it was the best thing I ever did putting all that time into her for, for six months I don't think I've ever spent so much time with a puppy in my life and it's really paid off oh gosh I know that's such a good thing for listeners to listen to actually you say that because it does pay off you know the time and the energy and patience that you put in but yes, and and I guess as well with National Guide Dog Day coming up, you must be pretty proud as well. You know that Dora's inspired this story that's gone on to help Theo and other guide dogs. Well, I I, I, I suppose I am really. I mean, it was a bit of a personal project. You know, it was the, I have to say it was the stories that came first, and also the. That once I conceived the idea of the book, then I thought, well, you know, if people don't want to read the stories, they can look at some really beautiful photographs. And I've got two friends of mine, Karen Taylor and John Park, who are marvellous photographers, and they contributed images to go with each story. And my another friend, Edwina Hannum, who is an artist, she did a portrait of Dora. It's brilliant. Is, it's I love so it. It's so beautiful. I mean, she does do pet uh, projects although she is um she does lots of she does portraits really I mean, but she's just amazing and she designed the entire cover which is I think absolutely brilliant because she conceived this idea of it if the dog gets it like it's being kidnapped so it's like set out in, in the, like when you when you go kidnapping people you send in yes. you, know, you, cut, you cut up bits of um, newspaper and you stick it on and you say I want ten thousand pounds for my Labrador back please so anyway, she designed it like that. Yeah, it's great. Or it's a bit like it's a bit punk rock, I think, as well. It is. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, have you actually got that portrait framed and hanging? Yes. In your... Yes. Oh. Yes, I do. I do. I do. And she, Dora was quite young then. We had to take about a gazillion photographs until I said, "I, I like that one. Can we agree on that one?" So then Edwina took the photograph and 
and she produces absolutely beautiful portrait of Laura. So that's on the front and the back of the book. It's lovely, but also I must just say that but all the other illustrations through the book, yeah, the photos are great. Some of them are quite eerie, you know. What's <laughs> the one where you've got the tomb and just random shots that you think, oh, very yes. good. They kind of trigger the imagination and that's what it's all about. It is, it is. Um, and you, uh, I think you know, when, when you're a dog owner, you have to use your imagination. You have to think like a dog to stop the the dog you know indulging in adverse behavior you have to put yourself in the position of like what's he going to do now what's he going to do now how do we stop this so so yeah all of those photographs that were in the book um, quite a lot um were taken on uh travel because i as I say i've done the journalist so I'm, I'm the travel writer so a lot of the stories are set in places i've been to and the photographs not all of them obviously um they are there from from the trips so it you know it, it does work in that respect that you, you've got the correlation between the words and the image hopefully it's brilliant no I honestly I think um I think it's great I really do Beverly and I think um, everyone must download the book get the book so how do people get the book unfortunately I don't I don't have it on Amazon or anything like that it's through me so it would have to be through my website, my, either my website, or you could get in contact with me directly um, through my email. Well, great. Well, we'll make sure that we put your email, Beverly, in the show notes so people can um, do that. Short stories, I, I think they're great when you haven't got time to read a massive book, but you want some enrichment. And, and enrichment, as we know, for dogs and humans is very important. It is, and it's marvellous lab reading. You can just have time for a quick story while you're in there and then out again and off on your way to go dog walking and training. Exactly, and having a great time, just you and your dog. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So if you, if you, do, if, if you do want to help the guide dogs, then please please do buy it or um, contribute anywhere to the, uh, the National Association of the Guide Dogs for the Blind. Yes, no, a brilliant charity. And of course, yeah, you know, the Labrador is really, you know, the face of, of the charity these days, even though it did start with German Shepherds. But yeah, uh, yeah I know. Um, but look, thank you, Beverly, for joining us on A Dog's Life. And I really hope you'll come back. So I'd love to know a bit more about how Dora gets on and, and Lily, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I love I love Labradors. They are great. And that's why they're Britain's most popular dog. They certainly are. And with every good reason. Thank you, Anna. That's been lovely. I mean, Dora is like a dog with two tails for all the attention. So <laughs> I have to oh. calm her down now. Bless her. Bless her. The gorgeous Firefox red colouring, which is my favourite. <laughs> OK, Anna. Thanks so much. Thank you. That's our show, Mr Binks. What did you think? Yes, I know. Don't be jealous, but Labradors are really great dogs to train. What's that? Yes, you're right. It is time for Woof of the Week. <coughs> it is true that when you bring the right young dog into the mix with an older dog, you can really add a spring to their step, especially if you're adding a little bit of collagen too. <coughs> well, I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, Go on, rate and review the show wherever you tune into your podcast. Thanks again, of course, to Beverly Byrne for joining us today. And all the links are in the show notes. Thanks, of course, to Mike Hansen, my producer, for all the production and music as ever. Find out more about him at Pod People UK. And for me, I'm just at Anna Webb Dogs. What's that, Mr. Binks? Yes, you're right. We will be back in your feed next Sunday. But why don't you subscribe now? Because that way you'll never miss another show. See you next week. Bye for now.